Um, to begin today's presentation, uh, let me uh, give a 30-second uh, commercial overview about the CISIAC or the Cybersecurity IAC. Uh, first of all, please note our web address at the top, um, www.thecisiac.com. Uh, please note my e email address for any follow-up. Um, the CISI Act is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse for information ass assurance, cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge, knowledge management for DTIC. Um, I work for Quantarian Solutions that operates the CISI Act, and we're funded by uh, DTIC, or the Defense Technical Information Center. So funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DTIC. Uh, please check out our website. Also, we have a couple of LinkedIn discussion groups, uh, one that's titled CISIAC Software Intensive Systems Engineering, and the other one is CISIAC Information Assurance. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Uh, Greg Metzler is a Principal Security Analyst at SRC Incorporated, where he supports organizations in network defense, um, information operations, and cyber intelligence activities. He's held numerous government and commercial technical and leadership roles in global network operations, software development, security engineering, information operations, and business continuity. Uh, Greg's technical interest areas include secure cloud architecture design, identifying and countering advanced cyber threats, uh, critical infrastructure protection, and practical cybersecurity. Um, so now I'll turn this presentation over to Greg. Uh, Greg, please proceed. Thank you. And uh, welcome to today's webinar. Hopefully you will find it educational or informative. Uh, what I'm first going to do here is uh, open up with a little bit of background. You know, I told you my this life, uh, solution architect and security wonk, and in my last life, as you said, I, I, I Tom said I do work, uh, did work with global infrastructure. And the only thing I will say is that, gee, I wish the cloud were around uh, when I was doing that. My life would have been a lot easier in some ways. Um, and I suppose this is a, it's appropriate here to uh, give a couple of disclaimers. Um, the, the mistakes that are made here are mine and mine only. Uh, I am a geek and not a comedian, though I will try to be funny. And fortunately, he is muted so that as you guys boo me, um, I, I won't hear it and make me cry. Uh, I'm also not a salesman, so I'm not trying to pitch you any ideas or anything. However, I will probably mention specific vendors or technologies, and the reason I will do that is re really just to, to highlight the um, examples for you, and also it may have to do with my background and my particular slant on, on things. Um, and as we said, we will be providing you a version of the slides afterwards if you're interested. Okay. So, first off, is this talk even for you? All right, are you cloud curious? You know, yeah, I think you know. I think I know what this cloud thing is, but I want to know more. Um, have you been told, or are you considering moving your infrastructure to to a cloud or a virtualized environment? Um, have you built, or are you building your own, or are you a, a cloud geek like me and really want to look, you know, want to know more about different design patterns for high availability and disaster recovery, which is uh, which we will be going into, and uh, or do you just want to sound smart at dinner parties? Well, my my suggestion to you is that if you're answering yes to questions one through four, this is absolutely the place for you. Um, if you have answered yes to question five. Uh, not so much. Uh, you're welcome to stay, but recognize that if you talk about this kind of stuff at a party, you're probably not going to be invited back. All right, so what I intend to do is talk to you about what the cloud is and what it isn't. Uh, you know, there is a lot of misconception about what cloud-based solutions are, and then how you can leverage the, the cloudiness of specific infrastructure solutions to support your critical infrastructure needs. And then I'll go into considerations and best practices. And while my focus will be on infra critical infrastructure protection, this also applies to whether you're just trying to automate or um, move to the cloud for a business process reason or other reasons. So I think uh, you will find something out of the considerations and best practices that will be applicable to you, regardless of whether or not you're um, moving to the cloud because of business continuity reasons. All right, so starting off with, uh, let's talk about what it means to be cloudy, all right? What it is and what it isn't. It, it, the cloud is a, is infrastructure. It's provisioning infrastructure. When you pull away all the virtual and all the marketing lingo, what you come up with are data centers. 
they're very powerful data, data centers, and they're they're distributed. You know, so underneath the, all the virtual stuff is the physical, but it is the, how the virtual is put together, and I'll speak that in a minute. That really makes something you know either virtualized or cloud enabled. Um, it is not another name for virtualization. Okay, it's more than that, and I'll speak to that. Uh, it is also not a security solution. Uh, while there are elements of it that address confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and it may support your security objectives, um, it is, at the end of the day, a mechanism for providing software and infrastructure. And you have a role to play, and I'll speak to that. Um, it is a fantastic way to standardize your configuration and to scale in and out automatically and perhaps to uh, use some on-demand computing. Um, but it is not failure-proof. Just ask Netflix on Christmas Eve. Uh, they found out the hard way, and I will speak to what they have done since then um, to address that, and there are tools that you can use as well. Okay, let's talk about uh, something that's cloud-enabled. All right, virtualization does not equal cloud, okay? Um, I have a fairly extensive uh, background in virtualized environments, and it took me a while to really see the differences. And, and I heard a couple of years ago a, a great description that if you aren't rewriting your applications, then you're not doing cloud, cloud computing, you're virtualizing them. And I'll, and I'll, I'll explain why. Uh, cloud computing is inherently a user-centric experience. It's not, hey, let me call the IT guys and ask them to stand me up a server. It's you go out and build it yourself or launch it yourself. Um, it, the, the key elements, though, for me for cloud are is the loose coupling of data, the, the box that the data uh, and or the application software is running on, and the session. So that if you lost a machine or you scaled in and decided to drop a machine because you don't need as many of them running, the user doesn't notice the impact. That's a big difference from even a virtualized, a traditionally virtualized environment. It is massively scalable. Um, I say that, you know, really speaking more to the third-party clouds, the large cloud providers. You can still be cloud-enabled and have your own private cloud. Whether or not it's massively scalable, ultimately, of course, is bounded by your resources. And when you hear scalability, you'll hear references to horizontal scalability and vertical scalability. Think of vertical scalability as, you know, get me a bigger hammer. So I build up the server, I have more, I, you know, I, I shut it down, I add some memory, I add some disk space, I bring it back up. Um, think of horizontal scaling as the exact same cookie cutter boxes, um, but more of them and more threads of your software running through those, more users, but it's uh, the same size, just many more. And in most cases, what you want to do is horizontally scale, though there may be reasons you would vertically scale as well. Um, an example of vertically scaling might be if you're just you're setting up a test, you'll use a really small machine, and then you'll scale it up to run the test and then shut her down. So that's an example of vertical scaling. It is resilient by design, um, and I'll speak to how and why. And then the, another key element, and many of these come from NIST, but you'll see them also referenced in other places, um, it's on demand. And that's a different model for many of us, and I'll speak to that when I'm talking about the considerations, including uh, managing your money on it. All right, so let's talk about NIST for a second, uh, a little bit of buzzword bingo. And there will be plenty of them. If you have specific questions about buzzwords, and you're free, you, know, you can type them in and we can address them. Um, or you feel free to reach out to us afterwards. I'm happy to explain anything that, uh, that may be unclear. Uh, what are the three cloud service models? Now, for background, if we were doing this face-to-face, -face, you'd win swag if you got the questions right. Unfortunately, um, that isn't the case here. Uh, the answer, of course, is informa information or infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. The difference, infrastructure as a service, you have a bunch of boxes. Somebody else is hosting them. You, you, you know, upload your, ser your software, your, uh, your uh, information. Generally, the OS will come with it, but you'll have to bring your own licenses and things like that. Platform as a service, that tends to speak more to developers, not necessarily, but that tends to be here's a development environment for doing X, Y, or Z. And then software as a service is how many of us interact with things such as Netflix or Dropbox or, heck, even your uh, web-based email. Now, there is an emerging term in buzzword bingo, so this one will you know, win you a couple bucks at the, your, your favorite um, watering hole um, called, um, and it's actually uh, B, 
BP, Business Process as a Service, not PBAS, um, Business Process as a Service. And the best thing I can figure about this one is, well, one, it's a new marketing term, but two, it's, it's software as a service that you actually use uh, to run your business as opposed to watching zombie flicks on Netflix. So let's talk about clouds and critical infrastructure protection and how you can leverage those clouds. Well, um, my last life, I would start every July watching the Weather Channel every morning and hoping the hurricanes didn't come our way this year. And I'm sure many of you are in a similar situation, whether it be um, concerned about cybercrime, um, storms, ice storms, whether hurricanes, et cetera, um, or just accidents. So I want to talk to you about um, the, the, this first key element, and that is that everything fails all the time. Um, it's a great quote by, by Werner Vogels, and he is spot on. Um, they have, you know, Amazon and the other cloud providers as well have built that into their environment and have built that into how they recommend you build out your architectures within those environments. And what they have done, you can replicate within your own private clouds. So I'm going to speak to some of the things that you might see when you're talking to a third-party vendor or things that you should consider when you yourself are looking to build out your own cloud. But everything fails all the time. Now, I'm a visual guy, and so I'm going to try and keep that in mind for all of you. And um, so for the visual learners, you know, here you go, auto polo, okay? There are many lessons to be taken away from this. You know, wear a helmet, you know, um, don't drive around old-timey vehicles. Um, but the big one for me here is just because the technology is new doesn't necessarily mean it's appropriate to your use case. And even even the roll bar, which is really more of a grab handle for the polo player, um, isn't even high enough. So there you go, epic fail on many levels, um, why we don't play auto polo today. So let's talk about how you might use the, the cloud for your critical infrastructure protection needs. And, and this will focus more, you know, cloud-based vendor services. Um, you know, you want to protect your infrastructure from bad guys. There are sandboxes that, you know, sandbox services where you can protect your email. You can channel it all through their cloud-based service. Log analysis, that's a big one. Uh, mobile device protection, you have many devices on the road. You need, to, you need a landing zone for everything coming in and out of corporate devices. There are companies that do that. Social media sandboxing, there are organizations that want their employees to use social media at their office but, you know, or allow, want to allow them to do that, but they're still concerned about what might be headed out. Um, there are organizations, including government organizations, that use sandboxing where, it will, where the social media will be channeled through a cloud-based service to filter and protect against uh, unintended or deliberate information exposure. And then uh, one of my favorites is actually the, the patched and compliant virtual machines that are that meet your particular organization's compliance requirements, either custom built or pre-existing um, gold disks. And then of course there's the on-demand disaster recovery infrastructure. Uh, and this isn't to exclude items that you may be doing just out of convenience for yourself. And, and I'm not here to speak to the merits of any one service or the other, but let's say for instance you're, you're, you're backing up things, to, you know, you're dropping them in Dropbox for some reason. Now they're Obviously, there are pluses and minuses to every approach I'm about to talk about, and this isn't really the forum, unfortunately, for us to go into those. But uh, there are the existing software tools that are inherently, because they're leveraging cloud infrastructure, backed up across multiple sites, et cetera. And so there is a degree of disaster recovery built into them. But what I'm referring to here is more of the, I have this thing available when I need it, and that's, you know, I might be backing up my data to the cloud, and then when things go wrong, and as um, the CTO of Amazon said, everything fails. When things fail, you're ready for it. And the architectures themselves, you actually approach the development of a cloud architecture differently than you probably have in the past for your global infrastructure. Um, and it's, you're, you're, you're not building for peak um, inherently. In other words, you're not buying every server you might need. You're not, and you're also not underscaling. And I'll speak to that a little bit too. So talk about the traditional approach. Um, designing for things. You have your restoration time objectives, you know, how long can you live without something? And then your restoration point objectives, how much are you willing to lose, is really what those loosely translate to. That's not the exact technical 
definition, but it's fine for this purpose. And you have to make trade-offs. Why? Because you can't, you know, very few of us can have a 100% copy of what it is we need to run our infrastructure um, just sitting there idle. Uh, you know, you're trading off costs for availability, how long can I live without something, what things have to be done, what things are nice to do. And the, the disaster recovery spectrum goes really from off-site back up and in fact, one of my first disaster recovery mechanisms was load up trucks with servers and start driving to Texas. Um, fortunately, you know, we, we evolved from that, but to a full-blown hot site. And now, in the cloud, you approach this differently. You're not, HA isn't, high availability is not just for your most mission critical apps. You can design it into your applications and into the infrastructure through auto scaling and other mechanisms. Um, you can, Design for all of your users so that you don't bring them on because you're paying by the SIP, you don't bring them on until you need them. And it may be that you don't need all of your users right away because they have to get to the location um, or they, you want them to be able to, you know, for the first 24 or 48 hours take care of their, their family needs if it's a hurricane zone or something like that. Um, but you can design for all of your users. And everything can be off-site and multi-site is just a matter of course in how you build it. Um, what I would suggest, of course, is, you know, and I apologize for reading these to a degree, but snapshotting often is important uh, so that you, ha you can roll back to a point in time that you're interested in, and then, of course, loosely coupling the functions, and I will speak to loosely coupling in a minute. So let's talk about design patterns for the cloud geeks among us. Um, there are four main design patterns and there are variations on each of these. These are This is not going to have every single component in it that you need to work, but this will give you the general flavor of what they should look like. Simple backup and restore, something I call a pilot light. Um, simmer, to me, that, you know, that is a mirror of your infrastructure that you're trying to protect, but a smaller scale. And then the full boil, which is doesn't matter what happens, um, either side of my infrastructure, whether it be my local infrastructure or my cloud-based infrastructure, or maybe I have it all in my cloud-based infrastructure, it is scaled to be always on, always ready. So let's talk about the simple backup and restore. And, uh, you know, I like to talk about that is why <laughs> you need a plan today, all right? You need it tonight. And, and, the, and it may just be, let's point some of our most critical data at a place and let's just save it there. And when you think about that, don't forget about the configurations on devices that matter to you, uh, whether it be uh, core infrastructure devices or whether that um, be configurations for uh, products and services. You know, that's, SCADA is a great example of a play, you know, uh, you, there are services out there that do specialize in SCADA security that are cloud-based, um, but you may just want to just protect today, just protect your configs so that you can rebuild them if you had to. So I, I'm going to use AWS speak every once in a while so for available, they're called availability zones. You know, so you, you'll keep things in multiple availability zones. Think of those as clusters of data, of, uh, of da it'll be a data center or two. And you have clusters of those that form regions, okay? And so you have these availability zones, and you'll have it in multiple zones. You'll be backing up in one, and it'll be replicating somewhere else, or you'll be backing up to two. And, and again, some of those considerations that you need to be concerned about, of course, is encryption, the security policies, who can get to it, and from where. If you have policies set up that only allow you to get from the IP address space of your office, how in the event that your people can't get in there are they going to be able to connect? to the resources that they might need to pull down. And the cloud enables you to pretty much work from anywhere if you have it set up. Um, and I'll speak to some ideas on that as well. How much data do you want to keep? Uh, I have a streaming data source that I use for a specific customer base and I could keep it all, but we don't, you know, it becomes less relevant um, beyond, a, you know, a couple of weeks. So I don't keep it all. And then how long do you, you know, in terms of volume and both time? So let me, for the, again, for the visual folks, this is a simple backup and restore. You have a connection, you're back, you're repli you know, there's a zone to zone replication um, between the, the cloud site and then on the left is your on-site infrastructure. Pretty basic. 
um, immediately gets you distributed, immediately gets you off-site, um, potentially even out of geographical region, There's lot, and it's extraordinarily easy to set up, and you're paying by the SIP for the storage. Now, you tend to get, that's where you'll get hit is on the storage cost there. Now, let's talk about the pilot light. Um, the idea of a pilot light is, uh, particularly in environments with third-party clouds where you can build a lot of things via script, is that you have a small machine that's buzzing and is ready to launch, is going to be used to remotely access and launch the scripts that will then build out your infrastructure, but you are backing up your data the whole time. So you're enabling all the replication of your data. You um, have the VM images already picked, you already have that set up, you have the network infrastructure decided upon, the domains and the IP addresses and all the things that you know we geeks worry about, and then you have that basically set up as a script, and you run one little micro machine. You're back. You have a, plus your data stores, and then you launch when bad things happen. So the nice thing about that is, is that you're really only paying for the data storage in most cases, and the availability of reserved boxes in AWS speak. They're called reserved instances. Um, Price just dropped on those, by the way, quite a bit, so uh, they become more, much more affordable. But the idea is that they are available when you need them. They're not there all the time, and you're not paying for them all the time. You're not paying for the power of them all, you know, keep them powered all the time. You don't have to incorporate them into your patching plan all the time. You can, you can have the patches launch as part of the startup. It's actually a pretty powerful capability. Um, and that's what it, and this is what it looks like. So you have some boxes that are pre-built but either not running or built into scripts that are they could be created on the fly. And so this I'm showing you the example of where they're built but not running. But um, if you have a l large infrastructure that you need to replicate within, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, then I would suggest that you have using scripts and then pulling from different patches and different capabilities to keep again that loose coupling in your design. Um, in place because your design on the left, your on-site infrastructure will be changing. It's a lot easier to change a script necessarily than to go through and touch each new machine, each of your not running machines. So let's talk about the, the Simmer. The Simmer is basically a low capacity version of your existing infrastructure that you're using. And what I would recommend when you do that is that you have smaller machines that can be scaled or you have auto scaling capabilities there and you either throttle the inbound or you do what's called a trickle. And the idea behind the trickle is that some of your traffic's always going over there. Some of your business, whether it be websites or whatever, is always going over there. And it can be your, your fallback for if all of a sudden your website becomes extraordinarily popular. You, know, you launch a new product, you didn't expect it to be as successful as you intended, and you need that, at that capacity offload. So you can scale that, and then you can set boundary conditions so that it doesn't get too big um, and that it doesn't also um, shut itself off. So, and that gives that brings up the concept of continuous testing, and I'll speak to that a little bit more as well. So the example is always on but smaller. Um, again, you you would be paying for the always on aspects of these devices, but they they're smaller than you you know the the full blown infrastructure. But they're there, and if you set up auto scaling and you need to auto scale, then that is those can quickly be up ramped um, horizontally or vertically as needed. All right, so let's talk about the full boil. Um, this is the always-on, inter, you know, interwoven with your existing infrastructure. Um, the basic idea there, and we'll go to the picture, is that you're auto-scaling continually. They're fully load balanced between your existing infrastructure and that cloud-based infrastructure. It may be that you move all of your infrastructure to a cloud-based infrastructure, and you're doing this between zones or regions, uh, geographic regions, and the idea is that you have this load balancing and auto-scaling set up so that you know, the entire infrastructure is, is growing and shrinking, oh, is, that's important from a cost perspective, um, as needed. The, what that essentially means is that you have built in high availability and disaster recovery into the entire infrastructure, not just as a you know, break glass, press red button when things go wrong. So um, the next part is cloud security. You know, I think uh, Mick Jagger said it best, hey, you get off of my cloud. Uh, the security challenges is this concept of shared responsibility. A lot of folks think, oh, you know, the cloud is a secure, and, you know, and I said earlier that the cloud is not a security solution, and it isn't. It doesn't mean it's not part of your security process and solution, and in some cases it may be a better way to go because patching is easier, it's more consistent. Uh, there's several different angles there. 
Um, you're not giving up your role in security, though, because at the end of the day, you own what's inside the part of the cloud that you're, you've built. Now, maybe you own that cloud itself, in which case the hypervisor and below you are responsible for as well, the hypervisor being the thing that the virtual machines are running in, the software that's running on. Uh, you are inheriting the controls of the infrastructure that's being provided. And you may not have visibility of those controls. And, and what I mean by that is, is you, may, you may not be able to, well, you won't be able to monitor their infrastructure on a regular basis the way you may be used to. But it may even be that when you have to do an accreditation and you're used to going in and looking at the facility, they say, no, you can't come in. And um, that actually is becoming more and more common among the large providers, um, Microsoft, Amazon, um, some of the others, Rackspace. And the reason for that is that they have tight controls themselves where you may, if you have physical access to a box and you can pull the hard drives, you're never allowed logical access to those devices. Um, even, you know, Amazon, when you talk to them, they'll tell you that even their, their CTO cannot enter one of their data centers. That doesn't mean that when they went through the recent FedRAMP certification um, process that they didn't have to let people in. They did. But what that translates to is because they receive that, um, if you choose to move your gut, and let's presume that your government and you're moving to the cloud and you need to have a FedRAMP provider, um, they're not going to let you walk in and validate those controls. And that is not uncommon. Um, so the answer is, well, how do I know? Well, you look at those that from your, your higher-ups have already approved use of those environments, whether that be a FedRAMP, um, PCI DSS Level 1, of course, that's for um, payment, Systems, ITAR, uh, there are environments that are ITAR compliant primarily around who's touching what and the controls that are in place, and then, of course, the international standards. Um, and then it always falls back on, okay, so the environment's compliant, but are your applications? That, that really doesn't change. So it isn't a security solution in and of itself, but it certainly can enable one. Uh, the second challenge that I believe we have within uh, virtualization is that it is soft, at the end of the day, we took hardware and turned it into software and we haven't shown a very good track record with software. So, um, you know, people say, oh, but it's different now, okay. And then, like I said, you don't own a public cloud. I put public in quotes because um, they're really not public. If you have, if you're using a third-party provider, whether that be Verizon for your telecommunications or Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure for your, or Google Compute for your cloud services, you're running on somebody else's infrastructure, and that's pretty much true for, for most of us um, at some point along the bit path. But the ability to support encryption and the ability to segment off those environments is what you need to be looking for if you're considering a cloud solution. So let's talk about clouds. Um, cloudy with a chance ponage. For those of you with little kids and read uh, Cloudy with a Chance Meatballs, you'll, you'll, know, the, you'll know the reference. Uh, identity is the new or old security perimeter. Um, that's, and I say old because it really is about the information and who knows it or who can know it uh, or who, you know, not necessarily where it is. And that's been true all along. Uh, if I'm talking on a cell phone too loud in an airport or a bar about business and there's somebody listening, then that information is still getting out. It's just going out via a different mechanism than the internet. Um, so some approaches to that is, again, treating the information, the, the, the values in the information, not the medium used to convey it. And so ensuring that you have security policies, practices, and behaviors in place that, you know, loose lips sink ships approach um, is useful from a mobile media perspective. Uh, similarly, security controls in place to leverage the capabilities of the boundary that you're in from a cloud perspective or protect against the uh, vulnerabilities uh, are something that you need to consider as just part of your architecture. Now, multi-factor authentication is, and you can use whether you're using uh, mobile app-based or whether you're using hardware-based tokens, if you want your own on-site validator of your key management, you can do that with cloud-based solutions where they never own any of your keys or manage any of your keys. Uh, you manage them. 
And then uh, this controlled privileged user access. Okay, so there are, uh, you know, there's, if your identity is stolen, you know, it, it, who's the insider threat in the cloud is a question I had heard a long time ago. If your identity is stolen in the cloud, you know, it, once you're, and this is true even in a regular network environment, once I steal your credentials, I'm you, at least from the machine's perspective. You know, and we won't get into behavioral analysis of what keystrokes you're using and where you're searching and that sort of stuff, although that is an interesting topic. Um, the, the fact is, is that privileged users can do an awful lot of damage as we have seen recently. And there are cloud-based providers or those that have developed capabilities for the cloud, um, Exceedium is one that comes to mind immediately, you know, where they are assessing are not, they're watching what your privileged users are doing. Let's use system administrators. There's a, a layer of abstraction between what you and your system administrator, what your your data and your system administrators are able to do, to the point that some some products will even prohibit them using certain commands. And so the, there are there are, and this is a rapidly changing environment. Uh, so I, my my advice to you is just you plug into a group or you know a cloud security group or something along those lines and just try and stay in tune with it because it is rapidly changing both from an economics perspective in terms of cost and a technology perspective in terms of available um, tools and resources to protect you. Managing your data, all right, data aging, your lawyer will love that one. Um, data aging, you don't need to keep it all forever. Uh, you can mitigate the damage of loss just simply by managing what you keep. And that's true. You'll find that many of what I'm, the things I'm mentioning here are true in your current environment. Uh, but they become a lot easier in a cloud-based environment where you can actually set data aging policies automatically as part of the infrastructure build-out. And then the last one, of course, is encryption at rest and in transit. And it is amazing how often we don't see this. Um, Yep, and when it, you see the reference to Bruce, you know, no Bruce, it's not the answer, and, and, and that's referring to Bruce Schneier who said, if you think encryption is the answer, you don't understand the problem. Um, completely agree, but uh, it is part of the solution. Um, the and, and uh, like I mentioned, or you know, the key, the on-site key management devices, if you're particularly paranoid. All right, so let's talk about some other challenges that aren't necessarily related to security, but are still relevant to you if you're looking to adopt or considering cloud capabilities for your infrastructure. Um, many of them are region specific, the services, uh, in other words, there will be a cluster of, of data centers that are tied together and they might, let's say they're in Asia or they're in Africa or they're in North America or they're in Europe. Many of the services that work in those environments are tied to that specific region. There is a buzzword bingo term again called cloud orchestration. Um, that is an issue, and, and I put it underneath multi-vendor integrated solutions aren't, pract aren't yet practical. There are plenty of people working on it, but moving your information between those different environments um, is not necessarily easy. Um, that cloud orchestration um, buzzword where it, it is the management of data and processes and information flows between different cloud vendors, because let's face it, that you know, one vendor may offer something that you want and another vendor may offer something else that you want and they don't talk to one another. You, you need something to be able to help you do that. That cloud orchestration issue is also true within a vendor sometimes. They may have product offerings that are only suitable for a particular region or may become cost ineffective if you want to do it across two regions. The uh, application, you know, another challenge really gets back to us. Um, our applications currently aren't architected necessarily to leverage all the advantages of a cloud. So while I might be able to segment out sessions from, from user sessions, from data, from applications, and be able to scale in and out, the application may not support that. So you might be moving elements to, you know, of your business to the cloud that can't necessarily leverage the benefits that are there from a high availability and disaster recovery perspective. But as you migrate your applications, uh, it's an opportunity to look at, well, is this still the app I want to use? Or if it is the app I want to use and it's custom built or you know, built by your team, um, what, what's the migration strategy? So you can use the technology as a flaming hoop to jump through 
to change how you, your company currently does business. Uh, and speaking of that, business processes. Uh, one of the biggest business process challenges that you're going to run into is, and particularly if you are, are government, is that we're still getting our arms around budgeting for cloud use. Um, the bet, my best advice to government people is I said, you know, and I was talking with a Navy friend of mine, I said, well, go talk to the CBs or your uh, facilities people. Whoever's paying for your electrical power and water and how they do their estimating is probably not a bad initial approach. Obviously, you'll need to tweak it for the for the mission, but it's not a bad approach because it, this what we're talking about here is more of a utility model rather than a capital expenditure model where I'm going in and I'm buying lots of infrastructure and I'm going to depreciate this amount and I'm going to need this many people and they need to be around all the time regardless of the level of work. It's a different model. And there are tools that are starting to emerge that will allow you to – and. And each of the vendors has their own basic pricing concept, but the good news is, is that their, their pricing is public, so you can get a feel for what it's going to cost you. The bad news is that the applications that they provide aren't necessarily robust enough to address your business needs. But there are people, you know, Boyle's Law, there, you know, gas expanding to uh, fill the space provided. There is a need, and it is slowly but surely being filled by people that are building cost models. And then I go back to everything fails, all right? And the cloud is no different. So building your infrastructure to survive that is something that we will want to consider as well. Um, so the cloud challenge in this case, of course, is Dilbert. Uh, they lost the phone number for the cloud guy. Uh, that actually hit surprisingly close to home, one of my first disaster recovery events. Uh, we had people stuck on I-10, headed west to Texas, and the guy with the passwords to be able to make the DNS changes so that we could keep running on the other end, uh, was stuck on I-10 and his cell phone was going dead. So, does that, you know, bad things happen, plan for them. All right, so let's talk about some, some other considerations and best practices. Uh, now these are, you know, again, the, my theme here is critical infrastructure protection, but they really apply to any of you. All right, this idea of plan for all, all right, uh, this uh, a tech company CEO said, if you think you can, if 60 people can do the job of 600 people, then 540 of them should be made redundant. Now, obviously, there's a phasing issue of when you want to bring people back in and you know other elements, but his point's a good one, and the cloud enables it. Uh, you can build a plan, and you can build scripts in that pilot light, as I was describing earlier, to be able to scale up to your entire workforce if necessary. Desktop images is a great example, and all you need is a web connection. Use multi-factor authentication. It doesn't matter where they're coming from. You can make that a very interesting disaster recovery concept. Um, understanding what is needed and when, that's tough. Uh, most of us don't realize what data we use when we need it and, and when it needs to be back online. Uh, really, my, the best advice there is, is, keep, is exercise it because that's how you learn what you really need to be able to execute a business process. We always think we, we understand it, but we tend to find out the hard way when uh, the, de the levy breaks or you have uh, an outage. Uh, again, you don't need to build the peak. You just need to be able to scale the peak, and that's the auto-scaling. And then making use of the high availability features. There are, there are features within cloud, thir particularly third-party cloud, third cloud offerings, that recognize that your network or your network connection is having a problem. You can do keep alives. There are, um, you can look at DNS, and it can sense, hey, wait, this route. You know, there, there's some very intelligent DNS um, capabilities out there now, and or DNS-like, DNS-related, that will enable you to offload when you start to see a problem. Load balancing. You know, it, it, it works. Inside, with your server clusters, it works on steroids um, in the cloud. Auto-scaling. Now, you can set up things, and CloudWatch is actually, that's an Amazon-specific feature, but the idea is you can set a minimum. Minimum equals one. If I, I never lose everything, it will spawn a new thing, a new one, a new, new instance of a machine with applications and what you need lo loaded on them. Um, I, and I go back to that loose coupling. That is key. It allows you to pull different parts out without the whole thing shutting down. All right. Now, the, the next bullet is pretty, pretty important. Uh, carefully consider trade-offs of vendor-specific solutions. And I know that I'm reading right from that slide and that this slide is wordy, but again, they're being offered 
free artifact. What I mean by that is that there are a lot of emerging capabilities in, in particularly third-party cloud providers, and they are fantastic. Um, some of them are extremely cost-effective. They're extremely scalable and powerful. Um, that works until failure happens and you have a mission-critical process that needs to be moved, perhaps even from a particular cloud vendor for some reason. And then what do you do? So it isn't that you shouldn't leverage those capabilities. You absolutely should. I mean, they're, they're, they're phenomenal in terms of scale and speed. Um, but there may be some things that you don't want to put specifically in Redshift or in some other capability. You may want to keep those tied to um, more portable you know, MySQL, um, Hadoop, and other capabilities, even if it's a uh, role your own where you're going to have to build your own at the other provider because they don't provide instances with that already installed. And that's a trade-off that only you can make. And then take, it, take advantage of the cost-saving features. Scaling in and pilot lights. Um, the, the ability to be able to launch the infrastructure and build it out quickly based on a script is pretty powerful. Um, scaling in. If you no longer need it, draw back on what you're spending. You know, shut it down. You can set, hey, you know, these machines are still up, you know, and you can turn them off or you can have them auto turn off and so that you're not paying for them when they're not in use. So take advantage of those. Now, for best practices, uh, especially if you're not familiar with using third-party cloud providers, start simple. Start with that simple backup and recovery. You know, dump something up, you know, just put your data in a store where you can go back and get it. Um, licensing issues are one of those gotchas that you don't realize are an issue until you go to use something. Um, in particular, of course, you know, you, you, many providers will allow you to, to BYO, bring your own license. Know which, one, which licenses are supported that way and which ones aren't for a particular provider. In addition, understand how those licenses get reactivated because while you may be able to move the license, it may require a new key. In which case, how would you get that key onto the new virtualized device when you have a hardware-based device sitting inside your existing infrastructure? Those are the what-ifs that you want to walk through for each of these um, with regard to licensing. Because the time to find out that it would be really great, we could come back online right now, but the li and our license is portable, but we need a new key and we have no X, we have no phone service, we have no point of contact. Um, those are things that you want to have available you want to know in advance and, and plan around them. Uh, I've already, I, I keep beating up the loosely coupled system uh, topic. It, it's important. If it's message-based and auto-scaling, you can do an awful lot to, uh, to survive outages and to scale as needed. Um, I talk about, the last one I'll jump down to, exercising your disaster recovery solution. And the best example of that is what Netflix did after they had their outage. I mean, the unthinkable happen, and when you talk to them, they will they will say that, hey, you know, we learned a lot of lessons. They they've created something they call um, the Simian Army, which is different monkeys. They have Chaos Monkey and Janitor Monkey and a whole bunch of other monkeys, and each of them does a specific thing within the cloud. And many of them are publicly available. Um, Chaos Monkey being an example. And what Chaos Monkey does is that it goes in and, and you, you, ha you can opt in, you can set it to opt in or opt out. It is, they have released it to the public for, for general use and it's designed to go in and test your, your clusters and your, your auto scaling instances and say, okay, I'm gonna go in and randomly kill different instances and see what happens to your application. And it's designed to do that. It's, and they, you know, I, I don't know that they continually run it, but you could conceivably continually run it and find out when or if something breaks. I mean, they, they hit it right on the head. You know, we found that the best defense against major un unexpected failures is to fail often. And that's why, you know, the AWS CTO had said, hey, everything fails, including our own infrastructure. We need to be able to build for that. And so let's talk about cost, because at the end of the day, you can't do any of this if you can't afford it, all right? You have to really get a feel for your usage pattern, and you won't know up front. You, you're just not going to know. But there are tools in each of the, the major providers that will allow you to track your usage pattern. Um, they, they have advisor services that are, look at and say, hey, you know, you might be better off right now using this cost, you know, um, let's use a reserved instance instead of some other type of approach. Um, 
The reason that that becomes important is because, as I said, not only is the technology changing, but the economics behind the technology is changing. And so you, everything from price wars um, to just the decreasing cost of, of particular infrastructure is changing the cost model. And so while you're building your infrastructure, the cost model is changing. And so you need to be able to track that. Uh, spend time on the architecture. Uh, you know, we tend to go, okay, well, let's just mimic what we're doing now. It may be the perfect opportunity to, to say, let's do this differently. Instead of building for disaster recovery solution of 20, you know, or 20 percent of our organization, what would it really take, and what what would the cost of that be to just have it available? And then when it does go down, how much do we think we would need in the event that um, the unthinkable happened? The cost and capability trade-offs are there. Again, uh, the availability and capability trade-offs are there. I mentioned you know, if you, you shift from one vendor to another. And then that scaling in and scaling out. You want to save money, scale in and scale out. Get larger when you need to, and then when you don't need to, scale in. And if you built it right, you build it in a way that you don't cut off your, your users when they're trying to get there. All right. Building to minimum, scaling to peak is definitely a shift in what our uh, IT infrastructure folks are used to. So let's speak briefly about what you need to be asking or what I recommend you talk to your cloud provider about or ask your own engineering team. You know, what, how are you going to build in at high availability? What features exist right now? How much do they cost? You know, the, I've, I've mentioned the certifications and compliance. You know, what, what compliance measures have they met? The security of the, you know, the physical access controls, logical, you know, can they see your data? Could they see your data? Could someone else see the data? Yeah, we could if we accessed your key, but we don't. Um, no. Uh, if that's the case, then I would suggest that from an organization perspective, you execute your own encryption solution and use one of the key management solutions that allows your on-premises key management or multi-premise premises key management so that obviously if your local premises has a problem, you can still get in. Um, IPv6 support, something that many people don't think about, but should. Uh, in general, they do support it, but you'll want to double check. Talk about the cost management tools, what's available, because early on, you're not going to necessarily have a good understanding of what you need and how much it's going to cost. The portability, I've spoken to that, the licensing. Um, what, what applications, partners do they have? and what licensing models do they recognize. A BYO, um, no, you can't bring your own license, you have to pay for one by the SIP, um, all sorts. How does the cost of the instance change if you bring your own license? All those sorts of things. All right, so in summary, um, one, one, thanks for enduring me. Um, the final thoughts is this is really all about people. We tend to get wrapped around the technology and the infrastructure, but it is really about how your people work and how they thrive, and we need to build an infrastructure around that, or how they might need to work, and what would make them successful. Um, the, well, we can only afford this, or we can only do that, you know, obviously, at the end of the day, if you can't afford it, you can't do it, but the objective should be to build your security controls and your infrastructure around how they need to work, how they want to work, because they will be more productive and more useful to you. Um, it, this is, the, my, the second bullet, if, you, if you, the central feature of your information infrastructure is security, you're running a prison, not a business. Um, security is obviously important, but the business processes and the mission are absolute. So you know, there's that constant trade-off and tension between the business side of things and the infrastructure people and the security people, right? Those Understanding those choices and how I can best mitigate those isn't something that's unique only to cloud, but it is something that can be addressed in some creative ways by a leveraging cloud. And then the last one, of course, death taxes, unless, of course, your O oh, is a piece of fruit, and failure, please plan for all of them. Um, with that, uh, thank you for your time. Hopefully you found this remotely useful. Um, if you have further questions, uh, please ask them of Tom. Uh, again, we'll be providing a copy of the slides. Again, I recognize they were a little wordy, but some people read, some people look at pictures, some people just listen to me while they eat their lunch. And 
Uh, for the email address at the end, pmetzler at don'tspammybro.srcinc.com. Uh, the line through the Don't Spammy Bro, just remove that part. That's really just for crawlers later on that are trying to uh, spam me. And with that, over to you, Tom. Well, well thank you very much, Greg. Um, it was excellent. Um, let's see, I have some questions. Uh, you must have explained things too well because we don't have any questions from the audience. And, but I would encourage anybody that has questions as I ask my questions to either use their chat pane or Q&A pane to, to ask questions. So uh, let me um, ask a, a couple of questions here. Um, relative to like service level agreements or, or anything like that, I, I didn't see much about that in your presentation. And what, what sorts of things would you be looking for or are the most critical when you're, when you're dealing with service agreements with your provider? That's an interesting one, and it's really driven by availability of, of the instances that you want to use and the availability of the infrastructure and where those boundaries end. Um, in particular, getting to them is your responsibility. Inside your environment is your responsibility. Uh, but there are certain things that you might want to do to maintain your, um, your systems inside. For instance, scanning. You know, what are you know, there the architectures while we use terms like switch virtual switches and virtual routers and things like that, the architectures are shifting away from what we traditionally think of as routers and switches and how they work. So because they don't need to work that way in in these types of environments necessarily. So there are certain things that just won't work that you're used to doing. And then there are certain things they don't want you doing without prior notification. So you'll want to understand the security-related service levels, and both from a response from, a, you, know, it, you know, if their hypervisors were somehow compromised or a vulnerability was identified. You know, understand that. Now, whether or not you can change their approach is diff you know, really will depend upon the relationship with that particular vendor. Um, the pipe availability on their end, you know, when if something goes down, uh, most of them are scaled larger than we would ever consider, but uh, things do happen, and how long can you expect them to get those back online? But the big one really is, is where does the boundary end? Where does the responsibility become yours? And what can you do to mitigate the risk within your area of responsibility? I see. Very good. Okay. Now, um, I, I guess, uh, let's see, uh, sort of related is, how would you compare, how would you go about comparing one provider to another? Uh, well, yeah. The, you, I would, well, and I've had to um, both make recommendations on what third-party provider should an organization go with right. uh, or what options are available to them. Uh, how I would go about that is first and foremost, what am I, why am I going to the cloud? Okay, if I'm going to the cloud for high availability and disaster recovery only, I just, or let's just use disaster recovery. I'm just going to the cloud for disaster recovery. I want to be able, then I need to look at my use case. That's the first thing that I use as a consideration. Mm -hmm. If the use case is, well, I don't ever expect to need out of region protection, but I do need multi-site and I need to be able to access my information from X, Y, or Z, and I need it to run these applications. You know, that's how you approach them is, you know, do they have the applications that I need? Do they support a licensing model that I can live with? Do they have the geographic distribution that I need? Do they have the um, availability that I need? Do they have the resiliency, which is kind of a, mix, a mixture of several factors, but the idea being that, you know, uh, from a data reliability and availability perspective, um, if I upload an object to their environment, what is the the reliability of that environment and the resiliency of that environment? Do I have nine nines of uh, resiliency? Resiliency, right. You know, those, you know, do I have, and then what's the availability guarantees of the specific, so it's kind of an interplay of what, what, what I ask my provider, but it always starts with, do they meet my business needs? And it's kind of a blinding flash, the obvious uh, answer, and I apologize for that. But That's fine. That's good. Good. Um, good. I do have a question now from somebody out there uh, wow. wanting to ask about how you see the potential of cloud technology for developing countries and therefore infrastructures. Yeah, that's that's a, a 
the, the, the on-demand aspects of this is really, you know, when you look at developing countries, um, that's an excellent question, and it's one that I'm very interested in personally myself. And it is a phenomenal opportunity because when you think about it, I can't necessarily, you know, it, it, data centers are expensive in wealthy countries. They're, you know, they're just as expensive, and then you have available, you know, you have con confidentiality, integrity, and availability, right? From it, let's talk security only, let alone. Uh, and availability is a system property. In other words, it's affected not just by the application and the hardware, but it's affected by the external environment, the, the electricity, the uh, technical infrastructure. In some places, it's more robust than others. Uh, not necessarily worse in the third world, by the way. Uh, for emerging com countries, I think the power is the scalability and the buy the SIP acts, aspects of this. Now, if you look at purchasing power parity, you know the expense of a dollar in the U.S. versus the expense of a dollar or in another country, you know it could still be expensive. Uh, the, these, these, but you can get a micro um, for pennies on the dollar and still use and still have computing power that you wouldn't have available to you with an availability that you couldn't even dream of if you were in um, Central Africa, for example. So, uh, yeah, it provides an enormous amount of opportunity because you don't have to make the upfront capital investment in the infrastructure. Right. right. Yep. And a lot of times all you need is a browser to get to it, too. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Particularly from an application hosting perspective. Yeah, that's right. Right. Um, I, I guess as a Final question. I mean, uh, <laughs> with what you know about uh, today's technology, would would you p put your company's family jewels up <laughs> on the cloud? Would you know the whether it be your, you know, your customer lists or or you know things of that sort? Would, uh, would, you, would you use actually, the cloud? I would. Um, you know. The, the re, it doesn't mean you just go, you, the, the misnomer where you hear people choke is public cloud. Oh, wait, that means anybody can get to it. No, it, it doesn't. Um, the, when I compare what many companies can do from a security perspective because of the constraints that they are under financially, you know, internal political, you know, there are all sorts of reasons. Generally, the larger, in particular, cloud providers at the core infrastructure level provide one heck of a resilient product. And then internally, it becomes a matter of me protecting my information through access control, managing, and the tools are becoming available that you know, I might not even know exist in another environment for managing identity, man, um, controlling um, privileged users, so once I'm able to control privileged users and I'm able to manage the um, access to my information and I can improve the availability of it because of a, an architecture that I couldn't otherwise afford, I, I'm not, you know, the only issue you get back to is, is discovery and who can get to it. And obviously that's been a hot topic in the news lately and that's definitely something to talk to your provider about. You know, if, if, the, if your corporate data starts getting treated like an email or a uh, phone message coming through a you know a, a uh, long distance provider where okay the cell phone signal in the air is open to everybody that can listen to it technical limitations then this file will be dead on arrival and, and they know that so I there's when you look at the fact that Nasdaq is doing end of day processing in the cloud there are lots of other organizations that are developing ITAR related information in the cloud with the appropriate controls and protections. Yeah, I, I see no reason to not to. Okay. It doesn't mean I, I want it all there because obviously local is, is good. You know, a nanosecond is what, about 18 inches long? And there yeah, is delay. That's right. right. So, so that's if, right. if time critical matters, then colo or nearby is important. Very good. Okay, well, um, I think our time is up here. And, uh, again, Greg, I thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Um, uh, I think we got our money's worth today. So uh, I appreciate your time, and uh, uh, we like to, I'd like to also thank everybody that attended this presentation, um, and hopefully you'll come back for our, our presentation sometime in August, our next one. Uh, thank you again, Greg. Thanks for your time. Thank you, everyone. Bye now.